Warning, the Savage Nation contains adult language, adult content, psychological nudity. Listener discretion is advised. And now, America's most exciting radio talk show, The Savage Nation, home of unprotected talk, borders, language, culture. And here he is, Michael Savage. Just because Iranian hardliners chant death to America does not mean that that's what all Iranians believe. In fact, it's those... In fact, it's those hardliners who are most comfortable with the status quo. It's those hardliners chanting death to America who've been most opposed to the deal. They're making common cause with the Republican caucus. Welcome to the Savage Nation. Today's program is entitled A Path to War. And of course, the, the big news is that Obama was a salesman for Iran today. And I watched the entire speech and I must say this, if Iran had chosen someone to lobby for their right to develop a nuclear weapon and the speech had emanated from Tehran, they couldn't have chosen a better spokesman than Barack Obama. In an unprecedented arrogance, the president lied and bullied his way through a PR stunt orchestrated by the mullahs. His bullying demeanor aside, Obama lied, and I'm going to give you the reasons why. But before I give you the reasons this is a path to war, I must tell you, in all honesty, that the president is such a skilled rhetorician. He almost had me believing in what he was saying. And I am the ultimate cynic. I was listening to him and I wanted to say, don't believe a word he's saying. You can see him lying. You could see how his mouth changes when he really tells a big one. You could see how he looks like Salazzo the Turk in The Godfather, GF1. When he throws a big whopper, he does something with the mouth that's right out of GF1. If Coppola were directing Salazzo the Turk, uh, he could have studied from Barack Obama, even though Barack Obama at the time was only a college student, I guess. But let's get down to the actual realities of why this is a nightmare deal with Iran. The good news is that one of the most hard left Democrats today defected from Obama's path to war, Steve Israel who is no fan of the Savage Nation by his past actions and statements and is no fan of uh, conservatism. Steve Israel, one of the most diehard left-wing members of the Democrat coalition, defected today. He bailed out. He bailed out and he said, no, he's going to vote against the deal. It's a huge loss for Obama. And by the way, Israel's defection came this morning just before Obama's speech. It's the most important a speech not only of the day but of the week how can you how can you rank it so let's look at the speech itself obama said the choice before lawmakers is one of war and peace he met with american jewish leaders yesterday whoever they may be i never heard of any i don't know who they are i never met them i don't know who jewish leaders would be but he met with them that would mean uh, money money men uh money raisers for the democrat party and he said that if congress blocks the deal the only option he or the next president would have for stopping Iran from obtaining a nuclear weapon is military action. Well, he's wrong about that. He could have increased the sanctions rather than decreasing them. Iran was bleeding. Iran was broken. Iran was begging. Iran was weak. And uh, Obama came along just in time to save them. And so the argument is not a, f a very convincing argument that it's, it's war or peace. This is clearly a path to war, and I'll tell you why. It's a bad deal. One, Iran is not a trustworthy partner in anything. It's a nation known for its cheating. It's part of their inherent culture. Two, the inspections that are allowed are not adequate to catch their cheating. Three, Iran will receive $100 billion as soon as the deal is implemented. How do you think they're going to spend that money? On baby food? Four, Iran gets to keep its nuclear facilities and equipment. Five, Iran can continue its nuclear research. And we even promise to help them develop their nuclear capacities. Can you believe this? Six, sanctions are lifted on the Iranian military, including those forces who killed and maimed U.S. soldiers in Iraq. How's that for a, re a reward? Seven, Iran is not restricted in this deal from funding terrorist groups, including Hamas and Hezbollah. 
Eight, the deal will likely set off a nuclear arms race in the Middle East and make war more likely. Saudi Arabia is talking about getting nuclear weapons from Pakistan. Nine, the deal kicks Israel into the gutter. While we embrace Iran, our other allies are not so sure which side we're on. Ten, and the most telling in the minor key, is the fate of Americans held in Iranian jails on false charges were not even included in the deal. What kind of deal is this that he wouldn't even get Americans being held in Iranian jails on false charges? What kind of deal is that? The answer is a very bad deal, a path to war. And so there is more to this story than meets the eye. And I want to go back to Obama himself, where you're going to hear things that he said today. If you missed the speech, you must hear it. You have to hear this. This is a huge story. This is a very big deal. Boxer, of course, the woman who loves Planned Parenthood selling baby body parts, is very happy to be a front for the Iranian mullahs. But as I said, the three prominent Jewish Democrats who have some integrity, unlike Boxer, Nita Lowy, who's very liberal, Florida Rep Ted Deutsch, very liberal, Rep Israel, very liberal, all backed out of the deal. But that didn't deter Barbara Boxer. She's in on this all the way down the road. By the way, as a side note, as I said the other day, Obama is such a phenomenal rhetorician that he will be studied for decades to come. Corporations can learn from him on how to lie to stockholders. People will study how to tell a lie and make it look like the truth. This will be studied for maybe 100 years. The most skilled liar in the history of American politics performed today. And I must say he did a great performance. He almost had me believing him until I analyzed the facts, which I broke down for you. If you care to comment on this speech today, on the Savage Nation, it may be August, it may be summer, people are away, not important to talk about. It is very important. This is a big deal. And uh, the Republicans have announced they have 218 votes lined up to oppose Obama's path to war. And that's in the House, of course. But if the Senate also opposes the agreement, as I hope they will, both chambers would need to muster a two-thirds majority to override an expected presidential veto by President Obama. And that's where the few Democratic votes will be critical for both sides of the debate. It's not looking good for Iran. It's not looking good for Obama, their chief salesman. No, sorry, Bob. And where will the money go with the sanctions relief? Where will that money be used by Iran? For baby food? For baby uh, diapers? Let's listen to clips three and four back to back on the Savage Nation. It is true that Iran lives up to its commitments. It will gain access to roughly $56 billion dollars of its own money, revenue frozen overseas by other countries. But the notion that this will be a game changer, with all this money funneled into Iran's pernicious activities, misses the reality of Iran's current situation. Partly because of our sanctions, the Iranian government has over half a trillion dollars in urgent requirements, from funding pensions and salaries to paying for crumbling infrastructure. Sounds like Iran's America. leaders have raised the expectations of their people that sanctions like relief have. will improve their lives. We need sanctions relief from you. And that's why our best analysts expect the bulk of this revenue to go into spending that improves the economy and benefits <laughs> the lives of the Iranian people. Now, <laughs> this on. is not to say the sanctions stop, stop. relief will stop, provide I no... Stop, I just said stop. Are you deaf? And that's why our best analysts expect the bulk of this revenue to go into spending that improves the economy and benefits the lives of the Iranian people? Does anyone listening to the show believe that? Now he goes on and he admits that sanctions relief will be used by the military in clip four. Listen to this big whopper now. Now this is not to say the sanctions relief will provide no benefit to Iran's military. Let's stipulate oh. that oh. some of that money will flow to activities that we object to. Oh. We have no illusions about the Iranian government or the significance oh. of oh, the Revolutionary that. Guard and the Quds Force. That. Iran supports that. terrorist organizations like Hezbollah. It I supports proxy that. groups that threaten our interests and the interests of our allies, no, including so proxy groups for? who killed our troops in Iraq. So what are you helping them They for? try to destabilize our Gulf partners. Gulf but partners? Iran has been engaged in these activities for decades. They engaged in them before sanctions and while sanctions were in place. 
And whatever benefit Iran may claim from sanctions relief pales in comparison to the danger it could pose with a nuclear weapon. It makes no sense. So he's saying they're a dangerous rogue nation, and he's saying we're going to take a chance by giving them the chance not to develop a nuclear weapon, all the while helping develop their nuclear technology. And I know he has golf on his mind because it's near Martha's Vineyard time, and it is early August, and he shouldn't be working right now, but he had to try to squeeze one more in on the world. And he actually said they tried to destabilize our golf partners. Now, I don't know if he's referring to Ron Burkle, Bill Clinton, or who, but I really didn't know that Iran was involved in destabilizing golf partners. That could be an offhanded uh, reference to Donald Trump, by the way. I, I'll have to look in, <laughs> in, <laughs> into that. It's hard, to be, it's hard not to be comedic in the political arena at a time like this, so forgive me for these minor side notes. But remember what I'm saying to you. This is a monstrously important deal. It's so important that even Hollywood should pay attention to it. For one minute, even Katzenberg, Katzenberg, Matzenberg, Ratzenberg, and Geffen should take time out uh, from their important work of destroying the culture of the world and pay attention to what their candidate is doing to the United States of America and to the world's stability. Of course, we're talking about the Iran nuclear deal where he says it's war or peace, and I phrased it another way, it's a path to war for sure. I mean, if you're going to let them develop conventional weapons, if you're going to let them develop missile technology as part of the deal, which is what it permits, what kind of deal is this? It seems to me that Obama is a... I don't want to use a word that will turn off the people who think I'm a reasonable man. It seems that he's very tough on the American people and very tough on the mushy Republican Party and very weak when it comes to actual bad actors, as they like to say. I love the word bad actors. That's the newest phrase. That's like gravitas of 10 years ago. Now they take a terrorist and they call them a bad actor. Now they take a terrorist nation and call them bad actors in the region. Where do these words come from? Who writes this garbage? They won't even call terrorists terrorists anymore. They're just bad actors. Well, the worst actor is Barack Obama. He's the real bad actor on the stage because he's trying to sell us a bill of goods that's unsaleable. Now, you could say if this is all about Israel, you don't really care that much because you care about America and you're an American firster. And believe me, I know that sentiment has grown in America. Most Americans, even conservative Americans, especially conservative Americans, are American firsters, by the way. They are so tired of foreign entanglements. They are so tired of sending their sons to war to die and get maimed that they could care less about Israel or any other country. I understand the sentiment. But if it was only about Israel, I don't think I would be giving let us say this monologue today, because it's not only about Israel. I've said this before. Israel is a very flawed nation in an extremely flawed world in a very psychotic region of the earth. They're the best choice that we have in the Middle East. Putting aside the religious orientation of many people, putting that aside the belief uh, that many fundamentalist Christians have in the survival of Israel, put that aside from the point of view of politics itself Listen carefully to what I'm about to say to those of you who say America's interest should come first. Israel is the canary in the coal mine. They first know, they first feel, they first bleed from the Islamists in the world. And for that reason alone, it's not just Israel alone. It's Israel with the entire civilized world. I'm Michael Savage. This has been my opening. If you care to chime in on the speech that Obama gave this morning, which is a very important speech, the phone number is 855 400 7282. I'll be right back. Join the Savage Nation. Call now, 855 400 Savage. 855 400 7282. Savage. My Savage Nation is sponsored by SwissAmerica.com. It's the only company I trust to protect my wealth. Call 800 B U Y C O I N. Shut out the noise. If Congress kills this deal, we will lose more than just constraints on Iran's nuclear program or the sanctions we have painstakingly built. We will have lost something more precious. America's credibility as a leader of diplomacy. America's credibility as the anchor of the international system. John F. Kennedy cautioned here more than 50 years ago at this university that the pursuit of peace is not as dramatic as the pursuit of war. 
but it's so very important. Mm -hmm. It is surely the pursuit of peace that is most needed in this world so full of strife. Strife that you've ag aggravated. In plain English, strife that you've aggravated wherever you turn. You turned on Egypt. You try to bring back the Muslim Brotherhood. How come no one ever asked you about that? You turned on Jordan, our ally. Jordan begging for air power. You, you, gave, him a, the, the, you gave him a stiff, uh, you know, drop dead in other words. You went golfing. Jordan's on their own. Egypt's on their own. Are you really sure that the most uh, leftist president imaginable in American history? By the way, in history, the history of America has never seen anything like this. Ever. Ever. And he's saying what? What did he just say? Did you listen to what he just said? Listen carefully. Shut out the noise. If Congress kills this deal. No, no, okay, I don't want to. The pursuit of peace is most needed in this world so full of strife. So you could look at this two ways. The man actually believes what he's saying, and he's naive and doesn't really understand the world in which he lives. Remember, he had no international standing before becoming president. He was naked as a senator. He had no foreign policy experience whatsoever. And John McCain could have beaten him on that. By the way, bringing up that old war horse. But McCain shot himself in the foot once again. The man still has no foreign policy experience. If you look at the woman who negotiated this deal, if you've seen her, the tall, skinny, blonde woman who's popped up all of a sudden, here is a hardcore Carterite, a hardcore left-wing academic who has capitulated to the world's number one terrorist nation, Iran. And they're selling it as a path to peace. Nobody wants peace more than Michael Savage. But this is a path to war. And one thing I've learned from the time I was a little child and how to defend myself from bullies is that if you don't kick them between the legs while you can, they're going to eat your lunch. They're going to steal your lunch and eat your breakfast. And right now, Iran is a bully nation that's weak. If you got to go to war with a bully, go to war when they're weak. Not when they're carrying machine guns. Don't give them a nuclear weapon, Mr. Obama. It will be too late. Join the Savage Nation. Call now, 855-400-SAVAGE. 855-400-7282. Savage. I know it's easy to play on people's fears, to magnify threats, to compare any time. attempt at diplomacy to Munich. But none of these arguments hold up. They didn't no, not at all. back in 2002 and 2003. No. Nope. They shouldn't now. No. Nope. All right, we got, we got the potential. The same mindset. Audience. In many cases... I'll play it all. I'm in the mood to listen to it. No compunction with being repeatedly wrong. <laughs> Led to a war that did more to strengthen Iran, more to isolate the United States than anything we have done in the decades before or since. It's a mindset out of step okay, let's with pause the right traditions. Here. See, he's taking apples and comparing them with oranges. We all know the Iraq war was Bush's greatest blunder. I predicted it in 2005 in my book, Liberalism as a Mental Disorder. I said, this could be the greatest military blunder in history. Iran could be the big winner. And it'll be a greater Persia that evolves, which is what has happened. But that has nothing to do with this. The Iraq war has nothing to do with this. He is again posing... A false argument which is what a rhetorician does he's the most skilled rhetorician I've ever seen in my life he actually believes what he's saying I think I'm not sure how would we ever know how do we really know what another man thinks in their heart of hearts how do we know where his loyalties really lie am I questioning the loyalties of Barack Obama yes yes a hundred percent because everything he has done in my estimation, has not been in the best interest of the American people. Maybe small splinter groups of the American people, yes, but not the overall nation itself. He has decimated our borders with Mexico. He's permitted a foreign culture to invade our society. He has decimated our language, turning us into a polyglot nation, a Tower of Babel, and he has uh, fundamentally stamped out our culture. So I don't trust him on this deal. But the facts themselves should have you not trusting him on this deal. 
And what more do you need to know than one of the most hardline leftist supporters of Obama, Steve Israel, bailed on the president just before his speech? That was that was amazing. The timing of it was quite amazing. The only one who's not been heard from, and perhaps the most important one, is the Machiavelli and Charles Schumer. I know Schumer's probably monitoring this show because he knows them. And he's monitoring the show, let's put it that way. They all do, in and out. If they don't listen to it, they have a, a staffer listen to the show. And they know that in between the jokes and the humor and the, and the, the, the teddy and the, the meatballs, they know that I make sense. They know that I'm a voice of reason. They know that I'm the uncle that they once had in their family. You said, hey, moron, what are you talking about? What, you became a big senator? You forgot who you are? Idiot. You may be a senator. Have you forgotten who you are? Have you gotten reality? Are you that greedy? You need that much more power? That's what's going through Schumer's head right now. It's a deceased relative talking to him. <clears throat> and I hope he comes to his senses like Steve Israel did. I really do hope, hope to God that he puts uh, principle above naked self-interest. Let's put it to you that way. We have other sound. I mean, we called a speech. The team did a really good job today. And we have the best sound in the whole business in general. And we're playing, I think, the most important speech, uh, the important pieces of the speech today. So now let's hear from the other side, a side that I'm sure will rankle the Jew haters in the audience, those who pose as anti-Zionists, who are really, uh, whatever they are, it doesn't matter, we know who they are. They're fellow travelers with Tehran, fellow travelers with the PLO, fellow travelers with the baby killers on the other side of the fence in Israel. Here's former Ambassador Dan Gillerman on Obama's speech a few minutes after in the clip 11. I just fear that the biggest applause and the biggest celebration tonight is actually in Tehran and in Iran because here's the President of the United States, the greatest country on earth, the leader of the free world, apologizing, being apologetic for American foreign policy over the years and uh, describing how poor America will be all alone if this deal doesn't come through and then accusing Israel of opposing this deal. Now, he, he pointed out that every country in the world except Israel supports it. I'm not sure that's true. I am sure that Israel is the only country in the world who Iran threatens time and time again, including just recently by its president and the Ayatollah, to wipe off the face of the earth. And the biggest question truly is, what if the president is wrong? What if his belief in Iran is wrong? He's been wrong before. He's been wrong on Syria. He's been wrong on Egypt. He's been wrong on Libya. He's also been wrong on Iran. What if he's wrong? For him, it's another speech that maybe didn't go so well. For Israel, it's existential. And therefore, I think that the Israeli Prime Minister is doing the right thing by opposing this deal. This is not politics. This is not grandstanding. This is truly out of anxiety and a belief that he has been elected to prevent a second Holocaust, which the Iranians are denying while preparing the next one. Now, it is true that the president has done a lot for Israel's security, but if Iran becomes nuclear and this deal could very well end up with a nuclear Iran, then all that help will be of absolutely no use and Israel will be the target of Iran. And, you know, what I ask Americans to do is not to believe us and not just to listen to us, Listen to the Iranians, listen what they say when they chant death to America, when they want to wipe Israel off the face of the map, when they deny the Holocaust. Listen to them and take them at face value. They've lied before, they will lie again and they will cheat and they will try and deceive the world and become nuclear. Right, Iran will now not allow their sites to be inspected without a 28-day warning. Now they demanded the other day that they take their own soil samples, which could be created, by the way. So how can you trust a nation that is untrustworthy? Neither American or UK inspectors are allowed into Iran. The IAEA is a, what is that, UN? You know how trustworthy the UN is, right? The IAEA is not even allowed to take soil samples. They're going to be given soil samples by the trustworthy Iranians. 
So what can I say to you? What's the option? Haven't you had enough of this incompetent liar? A man who is so, so capitulating, so capitulating to the mullahs of Iran and every terrorist on earth, and so tough when it comes to the American people, and so tough when it comes to the failed Republican Party. So <clears throat> I leave it to the audience to decide for themselves. He blamed everyone else again. Everyone except himself. This, is, this isn't about uh, Obama's legacy. You're wrong about that. It's not about Obama's legacy. This is about Obama eliminating Israel. Never forget that he's... Ha you have to understand the leftist mindset. I was once a university individual. I was around these people. I know how they think. They hate Israel. They don't want its existence. They've always wanted a two-state solution. You say, well, what's wrong with that? That's fair. Is that fair to give the lovely, peace-loving Palestinians their own nation? And then what? Their own tanks, their own planes, their own air force, uh, their own uh, navy? How is that ever going to yield peace? It's an insoluble problem. It can't be solved. Who would have ever imagined that we have a worse radical in the White House than Iran has in the mullahs? But he is so good at this. I keep saying that to you over and over again. He is the most skilled rhetorician I've ever listened to in my life. He had me swayed for a few minutes. I, as strong-minded as I am, I, I almost believed him a few times. Because in my heart of hearts, I'm a man of peace. In my heart of hearts, we've all had enough of war. In my heart of hearts, it's enough already with fighting over everything. And then I said, wait a minute, but look at what he's actually doing here. He's giving away the store to a terrorist nation. He's throwing America's security away. Again, putting Israel aside. No, it's not America first with him. It's America last. 855-407-282. What would you like to say on the Savage Nation? I love this line about the Iranian people. I thought that was, that was the best speech, part of the speech yet. Where is that piece on the Iranian people that I'd like to hear for a minute? Can you play that piece again? This is wonderful. Listen it to is clip true three. that if Iran lives up to its commitments, it will gain access to roughly $56 billion of its own money, revenue frozen overseas by other countries. But the notion that this will be a game changer, with all this money funneled into Iran's pernicious activities, misses the reality of Iran's current situation. Partly because of our sanctions, the Iranian government has over half a trillion dollars in urgent requirements, from funding pensions and salaries to paying for crumbling infrastructure. Sounds like America. Iran's leaders have raised the expectations of their people. That Sounds like you. Will improve their lives. You're like a mullah. That's why our best analysts expect the bulk of this revenue to go into spending that improves the economy and benefits the lives of the Iranian people. <laughs> oh, come on. That's so absurd. Your best analysts who? University creeps who've never run a lemonade stand? A best analysts, a bunch of left-wing Marxists from the universities. Some analysts. Some analysts. They blow bubbles in the White House and ask the president what, they, what he wants them to write up. Analysts. All right, you see my position, by the way. There's breaking news, and it's sad. Play the, play the sounder. We can't avoid it. We have to go with it. Sad breaking news in the Savage Nation. Another movie theater shooting. Another movie theater shooting. Another madman. Hatchet-wielding gunman at screening of Mad Max. Hatchet-wielding gunman is dead thanks to the brave members of the police force. It was not Al Sharpton who took him down. It was not Eric Holder who came in and took down the gunman. It was not Barack Obama who went in there and risked his life to take down the gunman. No, the police haters didn't stop the madman. It was police who stopped the madman in the Tennessee movie theater. There are dead people. He hit some with axes. And thank God he's dead. I don't know who he is. Don't know who the suspect is. The suspect that was not identified was armed with a gun and a hatchet at the Hickory 8 Theater in Antioch, Tennessee. And we'll have updates for you as time goes on. How many dead? How many injured? We'll get that to you. What's the difference? An officer came into the theater, an officer not intimidated by Al Sharpton, and he was fired upon by the suspect. 
The officer shot back. He didn't have to call Al Sharpton for permission. The officer didn't call Loretta Lynch, our attorney general, and ask if he could fire back. He instinctually shot back. And then a brave Tennessee SWAT team came in. More gunfire. And the maniac was found dead. The maniac left two backpacks. By the way, the shooting took place during a screening, not of Cinderella, but of another violent piece of garbage put out by the boys of Hollywood Mad Max. Thank you, Hollywood Mad Men. Don't tell me there's no relationship between the violence and filth that you put out and what goes on in this country. But nevertheless, that's what just went on. This occurred two weeks after a, a, a movie theater shooting in Lafayette, Louisiana, during a screening of another movie put out by the drug addicts of Hollywood called Trainwreck. When are you ever going to come to understand that there are consequences to bad behavior? 855-400-7282. What would you like to say on this issue? WJR, Skip, go ahead, please. You're up. You're the first caller on the Savage Nation. Hello. Yeah, fire away, Skip. Come on. You're listening. you got a big audience there. Well, hey, Yatsahara, Yatsahatov. This guy. All right. Thanks for the call. Okay. I don't know. We're here. Th thanks for the call screening. Was he calling from a movie theater in Tennessee under a seat? Uh, WABC Fred, you're next up. Go ahead, please. How you doing? Listen, um, it's Obama, okay? He's trying to justify this deal with Iran by saying, hey, these people are chanting death to America. Not everybody feels that way. Oh, so it's okay for this deal. Well, let's bring it back home. The government's trying to implement all these, all these rules and regulations. Let's just take the hottest topic right now, same-sex marriage. Okay? Christians don't all feel the same way, yet they're being criticized and businesses are being ruined by our own God-fearing soldier uh, fighting blood, blood, blood. Yes, exactly. America's Christian community is being attacked on a daily basis by the mullah in the White House and his minions. Does that say it for you? Perfectly. The mullah in the White House and his left-wing mi minions, his anti-Christian minions, have a war against Christianity. I'll be right back. Join the Savage Nation. Call now, 855-400-SAVAGE, 855-400-7282. Savage. The Savage Nation is sponsored by Swiss America, the only company I trust with my financial future. Call 800-289-2646 or SwissAmerica.com. The time is short and the discussion needs to be long. Adam on WABC, go ahead, make your point, please. Yeah, yeah, the, the point I want to make is I hear, I hear all of you guys on the radio talking about how bad an idea this is, how how dumb this president is. I was over, nobody else has any suggestions for anything. How about, if I, how about if I give you a suggestion, which I've heard over and over again? Are you open to listening? You, you don't even know what I'm going to say yet. Are you, gonna you just said that there's no alternative to the deal. Isn't that what you just said? You guys keep saying that. Okay? All of you guys keep saying that. Okay. Nobody's Wait, Adam, Adam, excuse me. Are you saying there's no alternative to what Obama is offering? Is that what you're saying? No, you said that. All of you guys said that. You just said it five minutes ago on the radio. That's why. What, I what is wrong with you? Are you on drugs? No. Are you on medication? I suggest you pull over and call 911. You're on the board. You're uh, disagreeing with me. You're saying all I'm doing is ridiculing Obama. Isn't that what you're saying? Make a suggestion. Everybody, I'm talking about everyone. All you guys do. All right, I can't take it. You know, they say that hell is a place where there is no reason. I taught people like him. That's why I left teaching. The schools are filled with people with no reason. It's a hell for teachers today. They can't even hold an argument. So let me give you an alternative. You raise the sanctions on Iran. You don't lift them. You increase the sanctions on Iran. You squeeze them till they're screaming. And then you get a better deal. And when the mullahs say, you know what, after we got everything we want, now we're going to tell you this and that, they changed the deal after the fact. It's called the Iranian School of Negotiation. Used to be known as the Russian School. I know it from 30 years ago. So they're playing the Russian School of Negotiation, and we're playing the passive School of Negotiation. So what you do is you squeeze them, you raise the stakes, increase the sanctions, and you say, no, the soil samples come from us. Our inspectors go in. Two, you dismantle the facility at Natanz. You raise the stakes on the mullahs. You don't lower the stakes. Join the Savage Nation. Call now, 855-400-SAVAGE. 855-400-7287. Savage.
Warning, the Savage Nation contains adult language, adult content, psychological nudity. Listener discretion is advised. And now, America's most exciting radio talk show, The Savage Nation, home of unprotected talk, borders, language, culture. And here he is, Michael Savage. Just because Iranian hardliners chant death to America does not mean that that's what all Iranians believe. No. In fact, it's those... No, it's what you believe. It's what you and your leftists believe. In fact, it's those hardliners who are most comfortable with the status quo. He's a soft it's those liner, you notice? chanting death to America who've been most opposed to the deal. Notice They're he's a soft liner. With the Republican caucus. <laughs> Salazzo the Turk, Godfather one. Uh, okay, I watched the speech. And if Tehran had chosen someone to lobby for their right to develop a nuclear weapon, and the speech had emanated from Tehran, if it had been written by the speechwriters for the Mullahs, they couldn't have chosen a better spokesman than Barack Obama. In an unprecedented arrogance, the president lied and bullied his way through a PR stunt orchestrated by Tehran, in my opinion. His bullying demeanor aside, Obama lied, and here is why. But before I give you the reasons that this is a path to war, not a path to peace, I, Michael Savage, must say he is such a skilled rhetorician, he almost had me believing him. And I'm the ultimate cynic. But I didn't believe him, because if you look at the facts, they're unsupportable. The facts are this is a deal in favor of Iran with no benefit to the United States of America other than kicking it down the road to the next administration. In other words, getting it out of his hands right now, getting another a Nobel Peace Prize. And if you want to comment on this, please give us a call. There's one open line at 855-407-282. I've given you 10 reasons why it's a bad deal. I've given you 10 reasons why it's a path to war. And many of you are saying, okay, wise guy, what's your alternative? You don't agree that it's uh, war or peace, as the president says. So what do you believe, Michael Savage? What alternative are you offering us who are taking the time out of our busy lives to listen to you? It's simple. Whether you're bargaining over an, uh, an apple on a fruit stand where there's no fixed price, or arguing over a, a nuclear deal, it comes down to the same terms of negotiation. There used to be a phrase 40 years ago when I first started negotiating my own book deals. Maybe I should have hired a lawyer, but nevertheless, I was learning along the way, and I, I, I kind of lost every time I negotiated because the publishers were using the Russian school of negotiation, which is very hard line. And the Russian school, it works like this. Once you get your opponent to agree to the terms of a deal, you raise the stakes and you, you demand more. Then they say, well, well you can't do that. They say, well, take it or leave it. I'm, take it or leave it. Say, oh, okay, I'll go along with it. Then they raise the stakes again. They don't talk to you. Two weeks later, they call you. You call them and call them. They don't answer you. Two weeks later, you get a note saying, we want this, and they raise the stakes again. That, <clears throat> that was known as the Russian school of negotiation. Now it's known as the Iranian school of negotiation. And uh, I, I don't know how Obama can refer to the Republican Party as hardliners. That's, that's facetiously stupid. They're hardliners. And what, he's a softliner? Pushing through every deal imaginable? He's Mr. Softliner? Faking Obamacare, faking the gay marriage vote, everything he can do. He, he's a softliner, Obama. Well, he's very hard when it comes to the American people. He's very hard when it comes to the American Christian community. He's very hard when it comes to Israel. He's very hard when it comes to everything except the terrorist nations. Then he's, a, then he's very soft. Why is that? Well, I don't know. I'm not a psychiatrist. I'm only a talk show host. But obviously, people listen because they like what I have to say. Because I think that I give you a practical solution to things, sort of one man's opinion. One man's opinion is all you're getting here. It's that simple. One man's opinion. It's that simple. But it's the plain truth. I think the plain truth has a big audience in America right now, given the professional liars that we all deal with on a daily basis. I don't have to name them. You know who they are. But nevertheless, I think the plain truth has a market, and you're the market for it. Plain truth is, 
Obama has given away the store, the nuclear store. And it's a bad deal, and it's not a path to peace, it's a path to war. So what is the alternative? It's simple. It's simple. You don't do anything. You raise the sanctions. You don't go to war. You say, sorry, I couldn't sell a deal to Congress. I'm sorry, Mr. Mueller. And we're going to have to now raise the sanctions. We're increasing sanctions on you. We're putting in another oil embargo on you. You can't sell your oil, and we're going to embargo your oil, and we're going to raise the sanctions on you. We're going, to st we're going to take away every dime you have in any bank in the world. We're going to starve you until you do X, Y, and Z. X, you're going to let U.S. inspectors in. You're going to let U.K. inspectors in. You're going to decimate the Natanz nuclear facility. You're going to allow our inspectors into your underground plants. Go down the list. The rest is detail. Five, six, seven, eight, nine points. Then, then you have a deal. You go back and then you do the deal from a position of, of strength. Not giving them everything they want and then some. It's that simple. I don't see what is so complicated by this. And just to show you how weak Obama is when dealing with terrorist states, he didn't even get our uh, hostages back. Part of a deal of this magnitude? The first thing would have been send back the hostages and we won't talk to you. Instead, he got nothing for the deal. But remember what he did with Ber Bo Bergdahl? Remember who Bo Bergdahl was? The, the uh, man who fled his company? in the middle of the night, who abandoned his post and went over to the enemy. You remember how Obama got him back? He traded five world generals of the Taliban army for this one traitor. This one defector, five he traded for. He gave them right up. And he couldn't even get back our, our American captives being held in an Iranian dungeon. So what kind of deal is this? They, they, were, they were ramming it through. There's a reason they rammed it through. There's a reason Obama sounds like he's working for the other side. And I think many of you know what it is. They want Iran to get a nuclear weapon or two. Now, why does Obama want Iran to have a nuclear weapon? Let's take the worst case scenario. Many of you don't even care if Iran has 10 nuclear weapons. You're sitting somewhere listening to this show saying, you know what? What do I care if they have nuclear weapons? Israel has 100, allegedly 200 somewhere hidden in Israel. They all have nuclear weapons. Why shouldn't they have more? Well, think about that one. I can give you a couple of reasons why. Israel has never threatened to wipe a nation off the planet. Israel's never said, I'm going to use a nuclear weapon to wipe anyone off the planet. I don't know any nation has ever done that. Pakistan, which is a Muslim nation, has had nuclear weapons uh, for a long time now. They've never said, we're going to wipe India off the planet, thank God. They never said, we're going to wipe anyone off the planet. They're run by rational Muslims. Pakistan is run by rational Muslim leaders. Iran is not run by rational Muslim leaders. Iran is run by a, a group of fanatical, apocalyptic Muslim leaders. Do you understand that? If you only understood the mindset of the mullahs, you might be able to understand what I'm saying to you. It's not about Muslim versus non-Muslim. This is about rational versus insane. The mullahs are insane. They're apocalyptic. They want war. They want nuclear war. They don't believe that unless there is a war to end all wars, meaning a war that wipes out humanity, then their vision, their twisted vision of Islam cannot, can only be realized after that. Do you understand that? Has anyone ever put that on the table? Okay, it's too much for the average guy sitting in a traffic jam right now listening to the show somewhere in America. And there are a lot of you sitting in traffic jams. You're frustrated. You're angry. You don't make enough money. I go down the list, and you're listening to this, and you say, I really don't care that much. Let them all kill each other. A lot of you have that cynical attitude. I know it. I know I'm not a spokesman for Israel. I'm not a spokesman for any organization. I'm a man alone. I'm one man alone. You have to understand who I am. I don't go to parties after the, after the show with uh, AIPAC. I was never invited to the Bush White House while the others were. Rush went and the Rush cartel were invited in by George Bush. I was always a black sheep. I was not allowed in. They didn't like me. So you gotta understand I've always been an independent and the fact is I'm still an independent. And as an American independent, this is a bad deal. And as I call it today, it's a path to war, not a path to peace. That's one man's opinion. I've given you all of my reasons. If you care to chime in, go ahead. Let's go to line number seven, WBOB, Jim. Go ahead, what's your point? 
Uh, yes, I recently purchased the uh, audio version of your greatest novel, I think, yet to be Countdown to Mecca, read by Peter Larkin, and I'm just amazed at the way the story goes, how you throw everything in it from Solyndra to Obamacare, that the agents who protect us are getting Obamacare. And just the storyline that you have, everything in that is playing out. How you talk about the Russians and the Iranians, I mean, it's just a phenomenal read, and the person that's reading it, Peter Locke. Thank you. Well, no, it's interesting that the book received no play on any of the conservative outlets. Isn't it odd that they would ignore the most important political novel of our time? Yes, and I'm sharing it with all my coworkers. We're allowed to listen to uh, music at work, so I took it to work, and I'm passing it on. Well, you better not let your, your liberal boss hear about it. Uh, Jim, those are very kind words. I don't want the book to be ignored. Countdown to Mecca. It's a fabulous novel, and it's extremely political. It's, a, it's, a, um, it's an exciting book. It's a summer read. It moves quickly, but it's got a lot of politics in it, doesn't it? Yes, it does. I like how you threw in Solyndra and Obamacare and all that. <laughs> thank you for the kind. Thank you for the So there are people out there who recognize... Uh, that there's a broader picture to this show than may meet the eye. Jack Hatfield is my fearless San Francisco freelance journalist. He used to have a TV show called Truth Tellers, and he got fired because they selectively edited him. Doc Matson is a former uh, Special Forces soldier. He's a friend of Jack. Dover Griffith is his younger girlfriend. She's from the Department of Naval, Naval Intelligence, now an FBI agent. Sammy Michaels is Jack's younger half-brother. He's a former Marine. He's now a professional clown. The, the character everyone seems to like the most is my new character, Saul Minsky, a San Francisco-based gangster. Then there are other characters who I won't mention, all in Countdown to Mecca. I highly recommend it if you're looking for some fun reading this summer, but it's more than fun reading. It is about what's going on in the world right now. I think I'm going to read you a paragraph. I got a minute or two right here. Page 158, Countdown to Mecca. But the intent was clear. The writer declared General Brooks one of the new old guard, a contemporary replica of obsolete neoliberals, neoconservatives, and borderline lunatics who believe religion is the greatest threat to life in the 21st century. The writer then quoted from a General Brooks speech several months back where he said, Islam is at war with the West, whether we want to realize it or not, close quote. It was an accurate quote, and though presented in a way meant to make him seem like a borderline lunatic, was in fact probably the truest thing in the story. General Brooks inwardly sighed, if only the fourth estate was filled with more people like Jack Hatfield, he thought. Hatfield would have communicated the fact that General Brooks was not a lunatic, borderline or otherwise. Hatfield would have known and reported that while General Brooks had spent his entire adult life in military uniform, he had worked hard to keep his perspective as wide as possible. He'd studied art and voraciously read history. The final stages of the Eastern Roman Empire were a special interest and had been since his second year at the Virginia Military Institute when he was 15. Uh, one more paragraph. He had written a paper on the fiasco of the... Well, do you want to hear this? He had written a paper on the fiasco of the, Ang Ang of the dynasty for an independent study project at West Point. Later at command school, he had produced a 300-page report on the Fourth Crusade, analyzing the social aspects as well as the military ones. He was equally at home talking about how a Roman sculptor carved the statue as how a modern army moved to battle. Here we go, the, fit, the final paragraph. <clears throat> this broad background made General Brooks acu acutely aware of the danger Islam posed to the West. The administration was particularly blind and stunningly inept, but even the president's firmest critics were mostly unaware of the deep movements of history that were taking place. Analysts focused on regime change in one country and popular movements in another, while completely missing the deep radicalization that had swept Islam and informed every aspect of Muslim life. Jack Hatfield would have understood all of that. Sir, came the softly accented voice of his event coordinator, and I'll pause right there. I can't even read my own book well. I can't read scripts. Do you know that? I actually stumble on my own words. I'm so not a good script writer that my own writing I can't read. Isn't that odd? I can only speak extemporaneously well. That's very interesting. It's why I was never a TV guy and why I was never an actor. Did you know I tried acting? Did I ever it, it divulge that to you? Yep. 
in the fourth grade. I acted in a play once. And I remember to this day, they gave me a teacup and they said, make believe you're drinking tea. And I said to the teacher, but wait a minute, there's nothing in the cup. And she yelled at me. She said, make believe you're drinking tea. I said, I can't make believe I'm drinking tea if there's no tea in the cup. That was the one and only time I've ever tried acting. I'll be right back. Join the Savage Nation. Call now, 855-400-SAVAGE, 855-400-7282. Savage. Hey, our Savage Nation is sponsored by SwissAmerica.com, the only company I trust for wealth insurance, gold and silver. Call 800-B-U-I-C-O-I-N. Again, I want to say that uh, he is such a skilled rhetorician, the president, that he almost had me believing him for a few points. Until I actually thought about what he was saying, he is a skilled sophist, a school of um, a school of speech that was developed in ancient Greek times. He is an expert at sophism. Look it up. Almost had me the cynic believing him till I actually thought about what he was saying, and it doesn't hold up. None of what he said holds up. There's ten reasons I oppose the Iran deal. I give them to you. One, Iran is a cheating nation. They're known for it. The inspections are a joke. 28 days? Are you kidding me? Three, Iran will immediately receive $100 billion, which they can and will spend on weapons. Four, Iran gets to keep its nuclear facilities and equipment. Five, Iran gets to continue its nuclear research. Six, sanctions are lifted on the uh, um, Revolutionary Guard, the Iranian military. Can you believe this? Seven, Iran is legally able to spend the money to fund Hezbollah, Hamas, and other terrorist organizations. Can you believe this? Eight, it will set off a Middle Eastern nuclear arms race, which is astounding that liberals who are anti-nuke wouldn't see this when Saudi Arabia said that they're going to get a nuclear weapon. It's amazing to me that all of the anti-nuke people listening to the show don't see this. It will set off a Middle Eastern nuclear arms race. We know it abandons Israel, but that's something that the left has always wanted to do. And uh, it ignores the Americans held in Iranian jails, innocent Americans at that false charges they were not even released so what kind of deal is this i call it a path to war not a path to peace we have breaking news around america including the shooting at the movie theater in tennessee we're getting breaking news on that one who did it hatchet and guns it was not stopped by al sharpton it was stopped by police Join the Savage Nation. Call now, 855-400-SAVAGE, 855-400-7282. Sam. You know, we're talking about the corrupt Democrat machine uh, on a national level under Obama, and it is corrupt, make no mistake about it. Both parties have their corruptions. Obama represents the... Uh, let us say the nth degree of corruption in the smoothest act I've ever seen in my entire life. So now he's trying to sell us a deal with Iran and no one's buying it who actually analyzes the deal. So there's mu there must be much more at stake than we might imagine. You know that this show emanates from San Francisco. How many years have I said on this show, San Francisco is the most corrupt city in the United States of America? Have you heard me say that before? 10 times, 100 times? An article came out in the San Francisco Examiner, August 5th, which happens to be today, entitled, Public Officials Named the New Findings from FBI Probe of Shrimp Boy Chow. It's a Chinatown probe. And in the prosecution of Raymond Shrimp Boy Chow, a wide array of city and state leaders, including Mayor Ed Lee, were caught up in alleged bribery schemes, pay-to-play plots, campaign fund laundering, and state construction contract rigging it's astounding you've got to read the article if you're from the bay area or anywhere else you've got to see what happens when you have a one-party system as we have not only in san francisco but in the state of california when you have no checks and balances when you have no other party with any power you wind up with a banana republic which is what which is what i live in here i want to read you something from this article the arrest stem from a federal indictment alleging, among other things, that Chow headed an organized gang outfit in Chinatown and that Yi and Jackson committed a series of crimes to further Yi's political ambitions. This would make a heck of a movie. I'm sorry to say I make for a good ha a Jack Hatfield novel, but I'm not going to do another one. I'm going to read something from this which I find to be interesting. The FBI alleged in discovery that Ed Lee, that's the mayor, alleged, took substantial bribes 
in exchange for favors, notes the filing, which then goes on to say the then Human Rights Commissioner, Nazli Mohajar, <laughs> and Commission staff member Zula Jones facilitated those exchanges. Jones was reported by the F FBI, and I'm quoting now, to have said that former Mayor Willie Brown taught Lee to do business according to the filing. Jones reportedly said, and I'm quoting now, quote, you got to pay to play here. We got it. We know this. We are the best at this game, better than New York. We do it a little more sophisticated than New Yorkers. We do it without the mafia, close quote. The most corrupt city in the United States of America, bar none, is San Francisco. But it has a smoothness, a veneer over it of calmness, liberalism, above uh, any suspicion, very much like the president himself does. The president has the smoothest varnish I have ever seen on a skilled uh, rhetorician. The smoothest veneer I have ever witnessed in my life, which is how he got where he is and stays where he is. And many people are so gullible as to believe he's telling them the truth, where he poses it as uh, the deal with Iran is either war or peace. In other words, either you take this deal or we go to war. That's not at all the, the only alternative. War is not the alternative. Negotiation is the alternative. This is not a negotiation. It's a capitulation. What Kerry did here was not negotiate. He capitulated. That's all. That's all he did. He capitulated. He didn't negotiate. If you care to chime in, 855-407-282. Line number seven from WJR in Detroit, Michigan. Rich, what's on your mind? Uh, just to extend this idea of his rhetoric, I, I have a, a mental image that I find helpful whenever he talks, and that is I picture a bullfight. I picture a matador, who is uh, actually like uh, Obama, uh, entering the ring with only two things, a cape and a sword. And uh, even though the bull, which is like the truth, uh, is much stronger than the matador, a skilled matador, and he is the most skilled, can get the bull to focus on only the cape and to ignore the sword. And in that way, he ends up sort of uh, killing the truth. Just to take the uh, point. Beautiful. No, that's a beautiful analogy. And but you agree with me that he's the most skilled rhetorician you've ever seen. Absolutely. Absolutely. And uh, now here I, now have you heard anyone else in the business say that? No, you haven't. All you've heard is attacks on Obama, and he's this, and he reads a teleprompter, and he's stupid. They have it all wrong, don't they? So, I came to this years ago because I was intrigued with him and read his book very carefully. And I read the book that was uh, written in 2004. That's when John Kerry picked him as the spokesman for the convention. And that book sold out uh, tremendously. But he rewrote the book because if you go back, you can't find that book anymore on the shelves. If you go back and, uh, but if you find a copy of it, it's got pictures in it. All the pictures are removed in later editions, and uh, he talks. You, wait, you're talking about Obama's early book about what, though? Dreams for My Father. That's oh, his early autobiography, his early autobiography was more revealing? Is that what you're suggesting? Yes. In other words, uh, he changed it between the uh, election of uh, John McCain and the when he ran against uh, Romney. He pulled a lot of things out of the book. Originally. Yeah, he sanitized his history, in other words. Exactly. And what he pulled out was how you fool uh, a white person. He's got a, a very important chapter in the original version about, see, he gets in big trouble with drugs, and uh, his mother is off in Indonesia. He's living with his grandmother in Hawaii, and Grandma uh, pulls Mom back, and then he writes a very, it's a very well-written book. The guy is skilled at writing. But he, he uh, in writing it, he at times is in the you know, first person, and at other times the third person. And at the end of that section or chapter, he says you have to do, he does three things that help him uh, fool a white person. He, his mother comes in angry about the drugs. He senses very uh, early on that she isn't really as concerned about that uh, because he changes, he distracts her attention away from that. He says, well, I don't want to go to college. And throughout his whole early life, she beat into his head, you got to go to college, you got to be like your dad. And uh, so he very skillfully moves, the, moves her attention away from the drugs by saying, 
I don't want to go to college forcing her to argue that he is, or that he should. <laughs> then he summarizes at the end of this section uh, the three things he has to do to fool somebody. One is the smile. The smile is very important to relax the other party. Amen. And when he talked today, he smiled. He made a little joke saying, this death to American stuff, that's only the hardliners uh, in Iran. And then he Yeah, no, I, I watched every minute of the speech, okay. and I was, I was amazed at his skill in, in throwing the wind. Throw, as my father would say, the, throwing the malarkey. Says that, you know, only the hardliners or the Republicans in, you know, in their caucus. Ha, 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 ha. In other yep. words, he uses a smile. Then he's very skilled in words. His mother really taught him to do that. She'd get him up early in the morning, three in the morning. He writes in the book anyway. And, uh, you know, would uh, get him to spend three hours studying the English language. He's very skilled, and he perfected this at Harvard Law School, at putting out words that mean one thing to young people and something else to old people, one thing to whites and something else to blacks, so he can get both parties sort of agreeing with him. But he yeah, no, he's he's a he's he's a ma he's a magical man. I got to admit, Obama's a magical man. You can quote me on that. I watched the speech today, and I saw the most skilled rhetorician, pure sophism at work. And uh, I was amazed at how skilled he was. He was actually pulling me over to his side until I thought about what what he was saying. But he's such a convincing uh, um, speaker that you want to believe the guy. But always think of that image of the bullfighter. What oh, I wasn't, but Rich, I wasn't. At the end of the day, I, I, I said, wait a minute, what is he actually saying here? Because I know that the facts on the ground don't match the facts he presented in his speech today, Rich. No, that's true. So you are a student, you're a student of Barack Obama, huh? Was his mother as leftist as I suspect? Oh, uh, is he a leftist? Is that what you asked? No, was Barack Obama's deceased mother, may she rest in peace, as to the left as I think she was? Yes, she was. Uh, I don't, I actually uh, think it's more a case of how can I seek revenge on America, which, uh, in, yeah, she was. She was going. Well, why did she hate, why did she have a distaste for America, the mother? Uh, the woman um, came from parents who were, I don't know what their politics were. But they were hardworking American people who basically supported her and, and the young Barry, didn't they? Yes, except uh, uh, her, her father uh, named her with a boy's name, though. I mean, yeah, why was the mother named Stanley? I can't understand that. That's the key. The, the father, her father, didn't want a girl, wanted a boy. Oh, so that set up some, some uh, yeah. conflict in the mother. Right. Oh, boy. Now we have a gender problem here. Really, a, mater a maternal gender problem, that's easy to solve. That's not but what explains Barry's distaste for America, do you think? He's been so lucky, never worked a day in his life. Everything was handed to him. So far as I know, he didn't work his way through Harvard. He didn't work his way through Columbia. Didn't work his way through Pepperdine. What is he so angry at? He's angry uh, for the same reasons that Hamlet is, and don't laugh at that. He believes that his father's uh, you know, his father became an alcoholic and got involved in a lot of car crashes. And in, in Kenya, in, when, he, when he went home to Kenya, right? He had to. He was deported from America. Did you know that? Oh, you mean you mean when they still deported bad actors? Yes. Okay. So, but how did that affect the young Barry? Well, it it uh, affected him in the sense that that was the you know what's the title of his book? Dreams from my father. What was the father's dream? If you uh, if you go, you can find out. See, the father was at Harvard uh, Economic School, working on a thesis. He had he had uh, graduated with honors from the University of Hawaii, was accepted at Harvard in their master's program, and then accepted into the Ph.D. program, and was working on his thesis. Now he could never completed it, but if you just Google the father and look at his references, his writings. They're all about socialism. What's the, you know, why is socialism best for Kenya? Why is our socialism not working? The answer to that was, of course, the British uh, weren't. So he, so he was an anti-imperialist, an African anti-imperialist, and those dreams uh, transferred to the son, our president. 
and they happen very early on. If you can get the right edition of the book, the 2004 edition or earlier. You know, but I've known, I've known leftists who grew up and changed as they developed and looked around the real world and saw the country they were living in as opposed to the fantasy they thought they were living in. And they evolved along with the, uh, their ideas evolved along with their age. As they became chronologically more mature, so did their thinking. Why is Obama and so many of the left wing cadre and the left wing cadre around them? Why have they been incapable of evolution, in your opinion? Uh, it really is a he was separated from his father. His, I mean, his mother divorces the father right away because she learns that uh, he's married already to a Kenyan woman and has two uh, other two other children. That's why he was deported. I, I believe, anyway, if it, because the the uh, the father. Well, today today that wouldn't be a crime. He'd be made head of of HHS with that curriculum vitae. But uh, aside from that, you, you seem to be a real student of the president and his father and the dreams of the father. Where does this end? How does this end? This dream. God, I, I you know I. Uh, that that'll have to be fi that'll have to be reserved for fiction, huh? Well, you can look, uh, if you look at Hamlet and you think there are as many parallels as I do. How does the Hamlet act? The, you know, at the end of Act Five, when everybody's dead, who enters from the stage left is the Prince of Norway. In other words, the country ends up going. Is, is, Denmark is over overwhelmed. <laughs> Uh, by, uh, you know, the prince uh, of Norway that comes in and <laughs> takes it over. And I'm afraid it's going to end that way if somebody can't uh, uh, figure out how to... I think he has to be exposed. I think it is a case of arrested development. He never... Do, do you... Th okay, so let, let me... I mean, this is one of the greatest calls I've had in a very long time, if not forever. This is wonderful. Stumbled upon it. You're a very learned man, literate man, and you're obsessed with the president. Um question for you do you agree that he shows all the signs of psychosis i thought about that and is it psychosis or is it neurosis and i really uh end up going back to um uh, you know that that uh to shakespeare i mean basically yes but the malevolence that this man shows to his nation and the ability he has of turning his malevolence into an apparent love is is an act of mass a masterful act as we're, as we're talking about here but the malevolence itself i think indicates psychosis because why does he hate america it's not the america his father taught him it was it's not as bad as his father said it was look how good it's been to this character why does he still hate it He's uh, because it's been very successful for him. His his. Right. All right. So he's Machiavellian. He knows that hating America works. It's worked for street shysters like Al Sharpton. It's worked for many many people in many different different aspects of government uh, and and other areas of social services to hate America and put down America and condemn America while laughing all the way to the bank. I get it. It's a good game. It's a good racket. But <clears throat> the question is, where does this end? How do we stop this insanity? I believe he's insane by definition. People don't know what I mean when I say psychosis. When I say a man is psychotic, do you think he has to run around foaming at the mouth, screaming? I'll be back. Join the Savage Nation. Call now, 855-400-SAVAGE, 855-400-7282. Savage. Your Savage Nation is sponsored by SwissAmerica.com. It's the only company I trust for tangible assets, gold and silver. Call 800-B-U-I-C-O-I-N. This is Michael Savage. Uh, we're coming to the end of hour number two on the Savage Nation. Ten reasons to oppose the Iran deal. I called it a path to war, not a path to peace. And I said at the beginning, and I'll conclude with it, if Iran had chosen someone to lobby for their right to develop a nuclear weapon and the speech had been written in Tehran, they couldn't have chosen a better spokesman than Barack Obama. In an unprecedented arrogance, the president lied and bullied his way through a PR stunt that must have been orchestrated with the help of the mullahs. But I must say to you, he is such a skilled rhetorician he almost had me believing him, and I'm the ultimate cynic. Ten reasons to oppose the Iran deal. Michael Savage. Read Countdown to Mecca. You'll see the biggest reason.
Join the Savage Nation. Call now, 855-400-SAVAGE, 855-400-7282. Savage. Warning, the Savage Nation contains adult language, adult content, psychological nudity. Listener discretion is advised. And now, America's most exciting radio talk show, The Savage Nation, home of unprotected talk, borders, language, culture. And here he is, Michael Savage. The left has flooded America with an army. Some come here to work, some come here to kill, some come here to work the system, but this country has been invaded. It's been invaded, we've had an invasion, and there's only one man who I think, and I say I think because I don't know, might just might stop the invasion by building a wall between this country and the third world hellhole called Mexico. You see, if Mexico was such a great nation as we hear, we wouldn't be getting so many citizens of Mexico running here. If El Salvador was such a great paradise, we wouldn't have one-fifth of all the citizens of El Salvador living in the United States of America. No, they come here for a better life. Unfortunately, we're also getting some of the real rotten apples along the way because Obama has stripped the Border Patrol of all authority. The devil in the White House has stripped the Border Patrol of all authority. The devil in the White House has issued 600,000 green cards this year alone without any vetting of who they're giving, being given to, simply to advance the community organizer's desire to destroy the Republican Party. And now let's move on to the Republican Party per se. Rubio says the U.S. has a long and painful history of discrimination and it still affects minorities. That's right, you heard it. That's not Bernie Sanders. That's not the usual leftist demagogues like Hillary Clinton. It's Marco Rubio pulling out the race card. Now that he's fallen to where he belongs, which is in the one percenters, and I don't mean the one percent of earners because this guy couldn't make a living if he tried. No, he's fallen to the one percenters in the race for the presidency because that's all he ever was. A zero who was chosen by the uh, power brokers in the Republican Party because he had an avowal for a last name and he had an Hispanic background. That's how low it's gotten. And yet he said we have a history of racial discrimination. I guess he's felt uh, discriminated against this non-entity. Look, the country has a history with race. It's painful, complicated, and I think its impacts are still felt in many communities across the country. And I think that it's important for us to confront these issues because we can't fulfill our promise as a nation if you have a significant percentage of the population feeling as if the American dream is, not, is out of reach for them. So now Rubio shows his true liberal colors. He says that the U.S. has a painful history of discrimination affecting minorities. Now why did his family come here from Cuba? How does a non-entity like him become a senator? if we have discrimination? How does a complete flop like Rubio run for the presidency if there's discrimination? Doesn't make sense to me. But nothing makes sense that liberals uh, say. And I want to talk about who makes billions off the illegal aliens. I follow the money. I'm the only one who's done this. I've done the job of 60 minutes. 60 minutes won't do what I'm doing for you. I am doing something for you in the next 10 minutes that nobody in the media has ever done. I followed the money. I will tell you, I will disclose for you who makes billions off the illegal aliens. Now you're going to say, how did you do this, Michael? You're a one-man operation. Where'd this come from? Well, guess what? It's all in my forthcoming book, Government Zero. Now, I know I should not disclose this now and let others pick it up and put it into their books or on their shows, but I feel that this subject of illegal aliens is so great. I feel America is being stolen from us so rapidly that you have to understand why it's happening, and then maybe something will be done to stop it. You see, Trump is being smeared around the clock by cowards who ignore the evils of the Obama administration. And I feel that the media must tell us about the swamping of America by illegal aliens and who's behind this. Meaning, why is it happening? You think it's about compassion? Do you really believe that progressives love Ethiopians? 
Do you really believe that progressives can't wait to embrace a Somali and take her home for uh, some tea? Do you actually believe they can't wait to welcome a Syrian into their apartment in New York City? Are you crazy? No, that's not the reason. But I followed the money. Who makes billions off the illegal aliens? Unfortunately, Government Zero will not be out until October, but you can probably find it on Amazon. Let me begin. I followed the money. And I'm going to read it to you from my forthcoming book. I found out who's behind this immigration crisis. There was an article all over the media a few months ago about the luxury hotels being rehabbed for the illegal alien children. Obama to pay illegals and offer all-you-can-eat meals, free cable TV, lawyers, medical and dental, close quote, on a 29-acre complex that ICE probably showed off to the media uh, that week. It was a renovated detention center for illegal alien families in Carnes City, Texas. And so criminals in the hedge fund business saw an opportunity. And the sharks, the anti-American vermin on Wall Street moved in. And they converted a detention center into a money-making center, a profit-making center. Where's the money coming from? Who are the contractors? Who are the contractors that are making and are going to make billions of dollars off the illegal alien amnesty surge that Obama is causing, in this case, the children from Central America? Somebody's making money off this, I said, because we found the RFP that was put out for housing and clothing and feeding these children. I actually found the RFP, the Request for Proposals. That's how the government issues contracts. They put out an RFP, and allegedly there is a bidding contest. And the government had been plot plotting to bring in all of these children for at least a year. I figured someone was making a fortune on it, but I didn't know who. So I wake up and I found out that these children in these detention centers we're going to get flat screen TVs. Are you listening to me? If you're a poor American, do you have a beauty parlor at your disposal for free? Do you have a flat screen TV? Do you have free lawyers, free doctors, free dentists? Do you have a workout gym in your poor community? Do you have a swimming pool in your community? Do you have a soccer field in your housing complex? Well, Obama gave them all of these things. All of these things. So I said, wait a minute. Somebody's making a fortune off of this. A $50 million federal government contract to house illegal aliens at another facility that was blocked, blocked to the press, and yet they're moving them in there? Many of the rooms are suites from a former hotel. You heard me. Private toilets for the illegals, private showers, flat screen TVs, cable TV, soccer fields. You get the picture, right? Well, guess what? Some people are getting rich off the billion dollar immigration surge, and they're not all Democrats. This is all from Government Zero, which will be out in October. I'm reading it to you. I'm giving it away. Someone's going to steal his book. So I'll be Abby Hoffman for the moment. I'm used to it. Go ahead, make my day, steal it. Only a handful of U.S. corporations have the honor of long-term contracts with federal agencies that deal with the immigration problem. It's a closed shop. And for these companies, the latest surge from Guatemala and El Salvador, that was last summer, has meant big profits, big business. And Obama's pushing for emergency funding for so-called family detention centers like the one in Texas. Resorts, they are. Soccer fields with artificial turf, lighting, flat screen TVs, pools, amenities you might get on a vacation once a year if you had the money. So why are you and I spending so much money on those who break our laws? The answer is because of profiteers, who I will name in a moment. You see, every television, every desk lamp, every blade of fake soccer grass has a huge markup to it. You heard about the $32 aspirin in hospitals, right? Well, that's nothing compared to what these companies are making in these illegal alien detention facilities. It's connected to the companies that run prisons for profit. Did you know that? Did you know any of this? Have any of the candidates told you this? Prisons for profit? Did you know about them? Well, I, Michael Savage, dug into the particulars of one such company that's making a profit off the immigrant surge. It's called the GEO Company. Who are they? In the past six years, GEO was awarded $900 million in ICE contracts alone, according to government data procured by Source US and delivered to you for free right here on the Savage Nation. This will be published in my book, Government Zero. Now, who was the parent company of GEO? I'll tell you that in a few minutes. Before I go back to this disclosure, something that is worthy of a 60 Minutes piece, but you won't hear about it. You won't see it on Fox News. You won't see it on the Drudge Report because I, Michael Savage, am the black sheep of the media. And ba ba black sheep, I don't give a damn. Let me tell you something. I've always been a loner, and I will always be a loner, and I'm proud of it. That's why I'm an independent and always have been. And so let me continue for a moment 
with a slight digression. I am an immigrant son. I am the only talk show host in the United States of America, maybe the only major media figure in the United States of America, who is the son of an actual immigrant. Did you know that? You didn't know any of that. My grandfather came here. My father came here when he was eight years old. I was born here. Does that give me a halo? No, but it gives me an insight into both worlds. I have one foot in the old world, one foot in the immigrant world, and one foot in the American world. I know how immigrants think, and I know the struggles of immigrants. So don't throw me into the category of those that you despise, because I can guarantee you that the progressives are more elitist than I am. This I can guarantee you, that your good liberal hipster friends really hate your guts if you're an immigrant. So let me continue. Who are these corporate profiteers? Who is the parent company of GEO Corporation? Wackenhut Corporation. Well, wait a minute, who are they? Well, it turns out Wackenut Corporation owns a lot of private prisons, and they then funded the American Legislative Exchange Council, ALEC. Did you know about ALEC? You didn't hear about ALEC except on Michael Savage. Well, what is ALEC? What do you mean the American Legislative Exchange Council? Who are they? Well, what they are is a lobbying group. They tell your elected officials what to vote on. They tell the elected officials where to eat, what to breathe, and how to operate. They run the country. Are you ready for this? Because what I'm about to tell you will change your view of politics for the rest of your life. Who is on the American Legislative Exchange Council? Who runs ALEC behind all of these resorts for legal aliens? Well, I have the names because you wanted to know the answers. You're not going to hear it from Arthur Washington until I tell it to you. And then one of her producers will copy it down and present it to Martha. And she'll cross her legs and you'll think that she gave it to you first. But now that Glenn Beck is on vacation, he can't steal it. Nobody can steal it except you. Take it and run with it. The top shareholders include people you have never heard of. It's actually an international organization. You see, they own facilities in the United Kingdom, Australia, South Africa, and the U.S. And the top shareholders are George Zoli, John Bulfin, Norman Carlson, Thomas Wirdsma, and Jorge de Minesis. I don't know who they are. But maybe some of their hedge funds or their hedge funds related to them may be familiar to you. Because if you have money in any of these hedge funds, they likely have money in the GEO group that owns the holding facilities for the illegal alien children, BlackRock Fund Advisors, Credit Suisse, River Road Asset Management, LLC, Eagle Asset Management, Inc., Scopia Capital Management, LLC, Carlson Capital, LP, BlackRock Institutional Trust Company, Hotchkiss and Wiley Capital Management, Vanguard Group, Inc. Well, you say there's nothing wrong. It's not illegal. Well, don't assume I'm saying there's anything illegal in what they're doing. I didn't say that. I'm just telling you, follow the money. So let me go down the list. Maybe you have mutual funds and you like the few percent you're making every year or whatever you're making. Well, they're also profiting from the illegal alien surge in America. You may think you're a Rock Rib Republican or a conservative and you don't want the illegals coming here, but you like your hedge funds and you like your mutual funds. Well, you're profiting as well. You maybe say you're a conservative and you're against illegal aliens. Well, here are the mutual funds that held GEO stock when I investigated it. A one-man show doing more than 60 minutes and I'm doing it for you every day for 180 minutes. Vanguard Specialized REIT Index Fund, Fidelity Small Cap Discovery Fund, iShares S&P Small Cap ETF, Prudential Jenison Equity Income Fund, Eagle Series Trust Small Cap Growth Fund. I can read the rest of them. You get the picture, right? But I'm not finished yet. I've just gotten started. Who is on the board of directors of GEO Group that is making billions off the illegal aliens that are being given luxury resorts to reside in? And this will explain to you why the Republicans, along with the Democrats, have been lobbying for amnesty in one form or another. I will give you the names momentarily, but just remember one thing, which I've told you for years right here on these airwaves on the Savage Nation. Whenever both parties agree on something, you can count on one thing. The American people are being screwed. I'll be right back. Join the Savage Nation. Call now, 855-400-SAVAGE, 855-400-7282. Savage. The Savage Nation is sponsored by Swiss America, the only company I trust with my financial future. Call 800-289-2646 or SwissAmerica.com. Michael Savage back here, the son of an immigrant. But I want to go behind who is on Alec the American Legislative Exchange Council, and who makes billions off the illegal aliens. I have about four minutes to finish this expose that would make 60 Minutes proud of itself if they still did investigative journalism. But I've just gotten started. Who is on the board of directors of, of GEO Group that makes billions off the illegals who are being given luxury resorts to reside in? And this will explain why the Republicans, along with the Deems, have been lobbying for amnesty in one form or another. 
Well, they're not household names, so I won't read them for you. One of them is uh, Norman Carlson, former director of the Federal Bureau of Prisons. Let me pause right there. The former director of the U.S. Federal Bureau of Prisons is on this private group, GEO. It gets even better. Also on the board is Ann Newman Foreman, former undersecretary of the U.S. Air Force. See, you were told women in the military would be much kinder and gentler. Well, there she is. She left the Air Force, and she's on the board of directors of this organization. She hasn't committed a crime, by the way. It's done by everyone. And look how well they're all doing. This goes along with the liberal credo. They come to do good, and they do very well indeed, just like the missionaries in Hawaii. They came to do good, and they did very well indeed. That's how the descendants of the missionary families in Hawaii still own the leasehold land generations later. Clarence Anthony, president and CEO of Anthony Government Solutions, Inc., Christopher Wheeler, Julian Wood. These are not household names. You get it? Wait until you hear the punchline because you haven't heard it yet. It's coming right here in the Savage Nation. And if you miss it, it's all in my forthcoming book in October, Government Zero, where it is memorialized forever, which is why you need to buy the book. Who is getting rich off the billion-dollar immigrant surge? Well, those companies, those hedge funds, those other funds. But are you ready for this? Because here it goes. You didn't expect this, but you heard it first on the Savage Nation. The Koch brothers, David and Charles, who are two of the richest people in the world, are key funders of the American Legislative Exchange Council, ALEC. Now you know why Michael Savage has never been invited to speak to that group. Now you know why Donald Trump has been excommunicated by the Koch brothers. I explained to you a few minutes ago what ALEC is and what they do. ALEC is a lobbying group, and they tell legislators how to vote. The Koch brothers are key funders of ALEC. And so there you have it. You thought it was all liberals who wanted amnesty. But now you find out it's very apparent that so-called conservatives who are now the guiding forces behind the illegal immigration surge that is now going on in this nation, they're behind it because they own these facilities with thousands of unused beds around the nation. And they want you to fill them and pay for them. Big business, big government, and big religion. All one bundle getting paid off your hard labor. Ladies and gentlemen of the Savage Nation, what I've just disclosed to you is worthy of a Pulitzer Prize. But you won't hear it anywhere else until it's stolen from me. And I don't care because at this point in my career, I become, well, what I become. Don't give me credit. Just steal this idea. Run with it because I've just gotten started. These capitalists have pushed Congress to bring in those illegal aliens by the trainload to fill the beds in many of their privately held detention centers because they make more money than did the druggies. Never forget what you just heard in these last two segments. Savage. Shut out the noise. If Congress kills this deal, we will lose more than just constraints on Iran's nuclear program or the sanctions we have painstakingly built. We will have lost something more precious. America's credibility as a leader of diplomacy. America's credibility as the anchor of the international system. Oh, John F. Kennedy cautioned here more than 50 years ago at this university that the pursuit of peace is not as dramatic as the pursuit of war. But it's so very important. Mm -hmm. It is surely the pursuit of peace that is most needed in this world so full of strife. Strife that you've aggravated. In plain English, strife that you've aggravated wherever you turn. You turned on Egypt. You try to bring back the Muslim Brotherhood. How come no one ever asked you about that? You turned on Jordan, our ally. Jordan begging for air power. You, you, gave, him the, 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 you gave him a stiff, uh, you know, drop dead in other words. You went golfing. Jordan's on their own. Egypt's on their own. Are you really sure that the most uh, leftist president imaginable in American history? The, by the way, in history, the history of America has never seen anything like this. Ever. Ever. And he's saying, What? What did he just say? Did you listen to what he just said? Listen carefully. The pursuit of peace is most needed in this world so full of strife. So you could look at this two ways. The man actually believes what he's saying, and he's naive and doesn't really understand the world in which he lives. Remember, he had no international standing before becoming president. He was naked as a senator. He had no foreign policy experience whatsoever. And John McCain could have beaten him on that, by the way, bringing up that old war horse. But McCain shot himself in the foot once again. The man still has no foreign policy experience. If you look at the woman who negotiated this deal, if you've seen her, 
the tall, skinny, blonde woman who's popped up all of a sudden. Here is a hardcore Carterite, a hardcore left-wing academic who has capitulated to the world's number one terrorist nation, Iran. And they're selling it as a path to peace. Nobody wants peace more than Michael Savage. But this is a path to war. This is a huge story. This is a very big deal. Boxer, of course, the woman who loves Planned Parenthood selling baby body parts, is very happy to be a front for the Iranian mullahs. But as I said, the three prominent Jewish Democrats who have some integrity, unlike Boxer, Nita, Nita Lowy, who's very liberal, Florida Rep Ted Deutsch, very liberal, Rep Israel, very liberal, all backed out of the deal. But that didn't deter Barbara Boxer. She's in on this all the way down the road. By the way, as a side note, as I said the other day, Obama is such a phenomenal rhetorician that he will be studied for decades to come. Corporations can learn from him on how to lie to stockholders. People will study how to tell a lie and make it look like the truth. This will be studied for maybe 100 years. The most skilled liar in the history of American politics performed today. And I must say he did a great performance. He almost had me believing him until I analyzed the facts, which I broke down for you. This is a big deal. And uh, the Republicans have announced they have 218 votes lined up to oppose Obama's path to war. And that's in the House, of course. But if the Senate also opposes the agreement, as I hope they will, both chambers would need to muster a two-thirds majority to override an expected presidential veto by President Obama. And that's where the few Democratic votes will be critical for both sides of the debate. It's not looking good for Iran. It's not looking good for Obama, their chief salesman. No, sorry, Bob. And where will the money go with the sanctions relief? Where will that money be used by Iran? For baby food? For baby uh, diapers? Let's listen to clips three and four back to back on the Savage Nation. It is true that Iran lives up to its commitments. It will gain access to roughly $56 billion of its own money. Revenue frozen overseas by other countries. But the notion that this will be a game changer with all this money funneled into Iran's pernicious activities misses the reality of Iran's current situation. Partly because of our sanctions, the Iranian government has over half a trillion dollars in urgent requirements, from funding pensions and salaries to paying for crumbling infrastructure. Sounds Iran's like leaders have raised the expectations of their people that sanctions like relief have. will improve their lives. We need sanctions relief. And that's from why you. our best analysts expect the bulk of this revenue to go into spending that improves the economy and benefits <laughs> the lives of the Iranian people. <laughs> now, this on. is not to say the sanctions stop. relief. And that's why our best analysts expect the bulk of this revenue to go into spending that improves the economy and benefits the lives of the Iranian people. Does anyone listening to the show believe that? Now he goes on and he admits that sanctions relief will be used by the military in clip four. Listen to this big whopper now. Now, this is not to say the sanctions relief will provide no benefit to Iran's military. Let's stipulate oh. that oh. some of that money will flow to activities that we object to. Oh. We have no illusions about the Iranian government or the significance oh. of oh, the Revolutionary that. Guard and the Quds Force. Iran supports that. terrorist organizations like Hezbollah. It I supports proxy that. groups that threaten our interests and the interests of our allies, no, including so proxy groups for? who killed our troops in Iraq. So what are you helping them They for? try to destabilize our Gulf partners. Gulf but partners? Iran has been engaged in these activities for decades. They engaged in them before sanctions and while sanctions were in place. And whatever benefit Iran may claim from sanctions relief pales in comparison to the danger it could pose with a nuclear weapon. It makes no sense. So he's saying they're a dangerous rogue nation, and he's saying we're going to take a chance by giving them the chance not to develop a nuclear weapon, all the while helping develop their nuclear technology. And I know he has golf on his mind because it's near Martha's Vineyard time, and it is early August, and he shouldn't be working right now, but he had to try to squeeze one more in on the world. And he actually said they tried to destabilize our golf partners. And I don't know if he's referring to Ron Burkle, Bill Clinton, or who, but I really didn't know that Iran was involved in destabilizing golf partners. That could be an offhanded uh, reference to Donald Trump, by the way. I, I'll have to look into that. It's hard not to be comedic in the political arena at a time like this, so forgive me for these minor side notes. Now, you could say if this is all about Israel, you don't really care that much because you care about America and you're an American firster. And believe me, I know that sentiment has grown in America. Most Americans, even conservative Americans, especially conservative Americans, 
are American firsters, by the way. They are so tired of foreign entanglements. They are so tired of sending their sons to war to die and get maimed that they could care less about Israel or any other country. I understand the sentiment. But if it was only about Israel, I don't think I would be giving, let us say, this monologue today. Because it's not only about Israel. I've said this before. Israel is a very flawed nation in an extremely flawed world in a very psychotic region of the earth. They're the best choice that we have in the Middle East. Putting aside the religious orientation of many people, putting that aside the belief uh, that many fundamentalist Christians have in the survival of Israel, put that aside from the point of view of politics itself. Listen carefully to what I'm about to say to those of you who say America's interest should come first. Israel is the canary in the coal mine. They first know, they first feel, they first bleed from the Islamists in the world. And for that reason alone, it's not just Israel alone. It's Israel with the entire civilized world. I must tell you, in all honesty, that the president is such a skilled rhetorician. He almost had me believing in what he was saying. And I am the ultimate cynic. I was listening to him and I wanted to say, don't believe a word he's saying. You can see him lying. You could see how his mouth changes when he really tells a big one. You could see how he looks like Salazzo the Turk in The Godfather, GF1, when he throws a big whopper. He does something with the mouth that's right out of GF1. If Coppola were directing Salazzo the Turk, uh, he could have studied from Barack Obama, even though Barack Obama at the time was only a college student, I guess. But let's get down to the actual realities of why this is a nightmare deal with Iran. The good news is that one of the most hard left Democrats today defected from Obama's path to war. Steve Israel, who is no fan of the savage nation by his past actions and statements and is no fan of uh, conservatism. Steve Israel, one of the most diehard left wing members of the Democrat coalition, defected today. He bailed out. He bailed out and he said, no, he's going to vote against the deal. It's a huge loss for Obama. And by the way, Israel's defection came this morning just before Obama's speech. It's the most important uh, speech, not only of the day, but of the week. How can, you, how can you rank it? So let's look at the speech itself. Obama said the choice before lawmakers is one of war and peace. He met with American Jewish leaders yesterday, whoever they may be. I never heard of any. I don't know who they are. I never met them. I don't know who Jewish leaders would be, but he met with them. That would mean uh, money, money men, uh, money raisers for the Democrat Party. And he said that if Congress blocks the deal, the only option he or the next president would have for stopping Iran from obtaining a nuclear weapon is military action. Well, he's wrong about that. He could have increased the sanctions rather than decreasing them. Iran was bleeding. Iran was broken. Iran was begging. Iran was weak. And uh, Obama came along just in time to save them. And so the argument is not of a very convincing argument that it's, it's war or peace. This is clearly a path to war, and I'll tell you why. It's a bad deal. One, Iran is not a trustworthy partner in anything. It's a nation known for its cheating. It's part of their inherent culture. Two, the inspections that are allowed are not adequate to catch their cheating. Three, Iran will receive $100 billion as soon as the deal is implemented. How do you think they're going to spend that money? On baby food? Four, Iran gets to keep its nuclear facilities and equipment. Five, Iran can continue its nuclear research. And we even promise to help them develop their nuclear capacities. Can you believe this? Six, sanctions are lifted on the Iranian military, including those forces who killed and maimed U.S. soldiers in Iraq. How's that for a reward? Seven, Iran is not restricted in this deal from funding terrorist groups, including Hamas and Hezbollah. Eight, the deal will likely set off a nuclear arms race in the Middle East and make war more likely. Saudi Arabia is talking about getting nuclear weapons from Pakistan. Nine, the deal kicks Israel into the gutter. While we embrace Iran, our other allies are not so sure which side we're on. Ten, and the most telling in a minor key, is the fate of Americans held in Iranian jails on false charges were not even included in the deal. What kind of deal is this that he wouldn't even get Americans being held in Iranian jails on false charges. What kind of deal is that? The answer is a very bad deal, a path to war. I'll be right back.
Join the Savage Nation. Call now, 855-400-SAVAGE, 855-400-7282. Savage. My Savage Nation is sponsored by SwissAmerica.com. It's the only company I trust to protect my wealth. Call 800-B-U-Y-C-O-I-N. I know it's easy to play on people's fears, to magnify threats, to compare oh, any I... attempt at diplomacy to Munich. But none of these arguments hold up. They didn't no, back in 2002 and 2003? No. Nope. They shouldn't now? No. Nope. All right, we got, we got the potential. The same mindset. Audience. In many cases... I'll play it all. I'm in the mood to listen to it. No compunction with being repeatedly wrong. <laughs> Led to a war that did more to strengthen Iran, more to isolate the United States, than anything we have done in the decades before or since. It's a mindset out of step okay, let's with pause the right traditions. Here. See, he's taking apples and comparing them with oranges. We all know the Iraq war was Bush's greatest blunder. I predicted it in 2005 in my book, Liberalism as a Mental Disorder. I said, this could be the greatest military blunder in history. Iran could be the big winner. And it'll be a greater Persia that evolves, which is what has happened. But that has nothing to do with this. The Iraq war has nothing to do with this. He is again posing... A false argument, which is what a rhetorician does. He's the most skilled rhetorician I've ever seen in my life. He actually believes what he's saying. I think. I'm not sure. How would we ever know? How do we really know what another man thinks in their heart of hearts? How do we know where his loyalties really lie? Am I questioning the loyalties of Barack Obama? Yes. Yes, 100%. Because everything he has done, in my estimation, has not been in the best interest of the American people. Maybe small splinter groups of the American people, yes, but not the overall nation itself. He has decimated our borders with Mexico. He's permitted a foreign culture to invade our society. He has decimated our language, turning us into a polyglot nation, a Tower of Babel. And he has uh, fundamentally stamped out our culture. So I don't trust him on this deal. But the facts themselves should have you not trusting him on this deal. And what more do you need to know that one of the most hardline leftist supporters of Obama, Steve Israel, bailed on the president just before his speech? That was, that was amazing. The timing of it was quite amazing. The only one who's not been heard from, and perhaps the most important one, is the Machiavelli and Charles Schumer. I know Schumer's probably monitoring the show because he knows them. He's monitoring the show, let's put it that way. They all do, in and out. If they don't listen to it, they have a, a staffer listen to the show. And they know that in between the jokes and the humor and the, and the, the, the teddy and the, he, the meatballs, they know that I make sense. They know that I'm a voice of reason. They know that I'm the uncle that they once had in their family. You said, hey, moron, what are you talking about? What, you became a big senator? You forgot who you are? Idiot. You may be a senator. Have you forgotten who you are? Have you gotten reality? Are you that greedy? You need that much more power? That's what's going through Schumer's head right now. It's a deceased relative talking to him. I hope he comes to his senses like Steve Israel did. I really do hope, hope to God that he puts uh, principle above naked self-interest. Let's put it to you that way. I've given you 10 reasons why it's a bad deal. I've given you 10 reasons why it's a path to war. And many of you are saying, okay, wise guy, what's your alternative? It's simple. Whether you're bargaining over an, uh, an apple on a fruit stand where there's no fixed price, or arguing over a, a nuclear deal, it comes down to the same terms of negotiation. There used to be a phrase 40 years ago when I first started negotiating my own book deals. Maybe I should have hired a lawyer, but nevertheless, I was learning along the way, and I, I, I kind of lost every time I negotiated because the publishers were using the Russian school of negotiation, which is very hard line. And the Russian school, it works like this. Once you get your opponent to agree to the terms of a deal, you raise the stakes and you, you demand more. Then they say, well, you can't do that. They say, well, take it or leave it. Oh, okay, I'll go along with it. Then they raise the stakes again. They don't talk to you. Two weeks later, they call you. You call them and call them, they don't answer you. Two weeks later, you get a note saying, we want this, and they raise the stakes again. And that was known as the Russian school of negotiation. Now it's known as the Iranian school of negotiation. And uh, I, I don't know how Obama can refer to the Republican Party as hardliners. That's, that's facetiously stupid. They're hardliners. And what, he's a softliner? Pushing through every deal imaginable? Faking Obamacare? Faking the gay marriage vote? Everything he do. 
He, he's a soft liner, Obama. Well, he's very hard when it comes to the American people. He's very hard when it comes to the American Christian community. He's very hard when it comes to Israel. He's very hard when it comes to everything except the terrorist nations. Then he's, a, then he's very soft. Why is that? Well, I don't know. I'm not a psychiatrist. Savage.